Last season, the Rams were more like lambs, but the 1983 contingent isn't soft or easy to fleece, as they proved in a wild and woolly contest against the Atlanta Falcons, who scored first on a Steve Bartkowski pass to Stacy Bailey, number 82. Atlanta went on to post a 21-7 third quarter advantage, but the Rams blazed a comeback trail behind number 29, Eric Dickerson, whose two scoring runs on the afternoon increased his commanding league touchdown lead to 12. Dickerson's second tally even matters at 21 apiece. Then with 17 seconds remaining, Vince Ferragamo tossed a two yard game winner to a very lonesome Mike Gooman, number 44. Rams 27 to 21 win up their record to five and two, good enough for a share of first place in the NFC West. The Falcons, meanwhile, own a two and five mark that makes them the black sheep of the conference. The NFC Central seller is the sole province of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who were well shorn by St. Louis and Neil Lomax's three scoring passes. Number 81, Roy Green's third period touchdown reception provided the Cardinals with a 20 to six lead that was tenaciously protected by tackle David Galloway, number 65, who registered quite an impact on Tampa's offense. Number 69, Rush Brown's fumble recovery enabled Lomax to throw his second scoring pass in less than half a minute and his second of the game to Doug Marsh, number 80. But Tampa retaliated by unleashing its own scoring blitzkrieg, beginning with a second of three Jack Thompson touchdown passes in the game. Number 83, Theo Bell's catch served notice that the Bucks were refusing to play the role of Lambs meekly being led to slaughter. And a scant 63 seconds later, Hugh Green, number 53, skillfully picked off a low max pass and returned it for a score. Despite their comeback attempt, the Bucks once again had the wool pulled over their eyes as they remain winless in the wake of St. Louis's 34 to 27 victory. A game plan designed to stop San Diego's Dan Fouts usually proves not to be worth the paper it's printed on. As New England head coach Ron Meyer discovered last week, when Fouts and number 82, Bobby Duckworth, teamed up for a 40-yard scoring play that helped stake the Chargers to a 21-10 halftime lead. Fouts produced his fifth 300 yards plus passing performance of 1983. And while Steve Grogan wasn't nearly as artful, he was aided by a San Diego defense that let victory slip from its grasp. Chargers defense has experienced its share of headaches throughout 1983, and in this contest, they were left sore all over by the New England running attack. While Grogan couldn't match Fouts's aerial yardage total, he was able to call on a ground game that nearly doubled San Diego's rushing output. Number 30, Mosi Tatupu did a neat impression of a pinball that caused San Diego defenders to register tilt. All four of New England's touchdowns were scored on the ground, including a pair by number 33, Tony Collins. The Patriots scored 24 points in the fourth quarter and the last 27 of the game as they emerged as 37 to 21 winners. For the once highly touted Chargers, their fourth loss of the season became another exercise in mere wool gathering and head coach Don Coriel discovered once again that tending this erratic clock is a frustrating experience indeed.
The lip can slip, the eye can lie, but the nose knows. And the Buffalo Bills knew full well that a win over the Baltimore Colts would give them a 5-2 and two record and sole possession of first place in the AFC East. But before the Bills got rolling, the Colts sniffed out a 7-0 lead on a flea flicker from quarterback Mike Pagel to Raymond Butler, number 80. That was the last time the Colts would fool the Bills. From that point on, it was all Buffalo. Running back Joe Cribbs, number 20, ran through the Baltimore defense for 105 yards and added another 50 through the air, scoring the Bills' first touchdown of the day. Time and time again, Bills quarterback Joe Ferguson beat the Baltimore Blitz. Linebacker Vernon Maxwell, number 56, blitzed on nearly every play. And each time, Ferguson read the charge and located the likes of tight end Mark Framer, number 86. When the Colts chose not to blitz, Ferguson had more than enough time to throw his third touchdown pass of the day to Frank Lewis number 82. Three Joe Donello field goals rounded out the Bills scoring, and indeed the nose knew. The 30 to seven win put the Bills alone at the top of the AFC East. Under the dome in New Orleans, a win would have kept the Saints tied for first in NFC West. And with a 13 to six halftime lead, it was clear it could happen there, but it didn't. The San Francisco 49ers blitzed hard and heavy in the second half, and the results were rewarding. For the second time this season, cornerback Dwight Hicks, number 22, returned an interception for a touchdown. This one going for 62 yards. Rookie running back Roger Craig, number 33, did Hicks a few better, rolling around right end for 71 yards. Craig's long distance jaunt set up Ray Wershing's sixth field goal of the game. And when Wendell Tyler, number 26, busted loose for 34 yards in the final period, he scored the Niners' first and only offensive touchdown. It was Wendell Tyler's first game in three weeks, and the lumps he took were worth it. San Francisco is tied for first in the NFC West. Against the Seahawks in Seattle, the Raiders' Jim Plunkett wound up with more lumps than a day-old pot of oatmeal. The Seahawks hounded the Raiders into eight turnovers, and their eight sacks were a team record. With wide receiver Steve Largent's sideline, Seattle quarterback Jim Zorn had his worst passing day since 1979. Number 10 completed four passes for two yards. Running the ball became his only alternative. Zorn's touchdown brought the Seahawks to within three points in the third period. The Raiders still had a handle on the ball game until Seattle's Paul Johns, number 85, got his hands on the football. John's 75-yard return for a touchdown gave the Seahawks the lead. And when rookie Kurt Warner, number 28, scored in the final period, Seattle had handed the Raiders their second loss of the season, 38 to 36. With the bizarre win, the Seahawks flew into the thick of things in the AFC West. Cliff Stout had ample reason for his Cheshire grin Sunday. 
He emerged a clear-cut winner in a battle for first place with Brian Seif, plagued with a long-suffering case of Three Rivers Stadium shell shock. It was a tale of two quarterbacks, Stout, who silenced critics with a club record 13 straight completions, including this 40-yard bomb to Calvin Sweeney, number 85. And his Cleveland counterpart, Sype, who was intercepted on his first three possessions, six for the afternoon, as the Steelers' home park continued to be a chamber of horrors for the Browns. They have lost all 14 games they've played there. Sype tried everything, nothing worked. This curious sleight of hand nearly led to another in the never-ending parade of Cleveland turnovers. The Browns' final drive was stopped by rookie Greg Best, number 25, who returned to fumble 94 yards. It was a sweet moment for the rookie, a training camp cut recalled just three weeks ago. For the Steelers' impressive defense, it was the seventh touchdown scored this season and their fifth in the last two games. The only bright spot for the Browns was the performance of Boyce Green playing in place of the injured Mike Pruitt. Green, number 30, scored both Cleveland touchdowns and gained 137 yards, the second highest rushing total by an opponent in the history of Three Rivers Stadium. The rookie is in good company, for only O.J. Simpson exceeded him. Cleveland's defeat earned Pittsburgh's sole possession of first place in the AFC Central and serve notice the steel curtain is back in place. Vince Evans has replaced Jim McMahon as quarterback for the troubled Chicago Bears. Against Detroit in the Silverdome, Evans had his best day as a pro, hitting 28 of 45 passes for 336 yards and two touchdowns. But Evans couldn't avoid the pass rush of Detroit's William Gay, number 79, who demonstrated the technique that's made him the leading sacker in the league. The Lion attack was paced by performances from two quarterbacks, Gary Danielson played the second half and fired a skyscraper to Ulysses Norris, number 80. Danielson had replaced Eric Hippel, who had been injured in the third quarter. But in the fourth quarter, with a minute 26 to go, Hippel came off the bench, and his scamper with a fake field goal sealed the Bears' due. The 31-17 win over Chicago was Detroit's second straight since an impassioned locker room speech by their owner, William Clay Ford. With three victories in seven games, the Lions are back in the thick of things in the NFC's tightly grouped Central Division. Another team on the upswing is Kansas City, where the horse and buggy of Marv Levy has been updated to John Makovic's all-out passing attack with three and sometimes four wide receivers available targets for quarterback Bill Kenny. The Chiefs' aggressive air game was tailor-made to take advantage of the Giants' injury-riddled and 24th-ranked pass defense. It made Kenny look like a superstar, passing for 342 yards and four touchdowns, including a pair to Henry Marshall, number 89. Giant quarterback Scott Bruner was rudely introduced to the NFL's top-ranked pass defenders. The Chiefs secondary leads the league in interceptions with 17. The 17th coming on safety Derwood Rockmore's steal and 42-yard return. Chiefs victory kept them in contention in the AFC West. Significantly, it was the first time this season they have been able to come from behind to win. For the Giants, it's another chapter in a story growing sadder by the week. The expression on losing coach Bill Parcell's face is self-explanatory. 
Two rookie head coaches met at midfield. Their teams appear to be headed in different directions. Cool, calm, and confident is probably the way Don Shula pictures himself as head coach of the Miami Dolphins. But those words might readily apply to his number one draft pick, quarterback Dan Marino. Against the New York Jets, the young Marino performed with the guile and skill of a time-tested veteran. A 66-yard scoring strike to Nat Moore just three minutes into the game was one of three Marino touchdown passes on the day. A dry and sunny day where the Miami defense proved that they don't need rain and mud to wreak havoc on Richard Todd and the Jets. On a play first pattern by A.J. Dewey, number 58, Kim Volcamper ran for a 24-yard touchdown on one of six Miami interceptions. Turnovers that were the difference in the Dolphins' relatively easy 32-14 defeat of the Jets. Easy is the one word that doesn't do well in describing the Dallas Cowboys' previous six victories of the season. The cry of come from behind has been the Cowboy wake-up call of this campaign. And when Ron Jaworski hit Mike Quick with an 83-yard bomb on Philadelphia's first play from scrimmage, Dallas, it seemed, was right on schedule. But it was an early schedule this week for Dallas. Perhaps it was the surprise of Tony Dorsett scoring his first touchdown almost halfway into the season. But when Dallas began rolling up the points, they came quickly and often. Danny White hit on 24 of 37 passes for two touchdowns as the undefeated Cowboys pounded out 522 yards and 32 first downs en route to, if you can excuse the expression, en route to an easy 37-7 victory. While Dallas continued to remain high atop the NFL elite for another week, the Cincinnati Bengals continued to be pushed further and further out of the realm of respectability. The rapid fall of the Bengals has not been without grace. Despite a crumbling offense and an injured Ken Anderson, Chris Collinsworth performed admirably against Denver. Collinsworth caught seven passes for 149 yards, while the Bengal defense staged a late third quarter comeback, tying the score at 17 with this Ray Horton 55-yard run with an intercepted pass. But true to their dismal 1983 form, victory eluded the Bengals again. Slowly and methodically, the Broncos wore down the Bengals with a ball control game led by the running of number 46, Dave Preston. While in the air, Steve DeBerg passed for 284 yards and two touchdowns, the kind of blue chip performance Denver had hoped to be getting from John Elway. Final score, Broncos 24, Bengals 17. With the prospect of easy pickings against the winless Oilers at home, some Vikings just couldn't wait to get in on the fun. Houston quarterback Gifford Nielsen, though, probably couldn't wait to get out of the Metrodome last Sunday. By the time he hit tight end Chris Dressel on his 35-yard touchdown in the third quarter, Minnesota had already built up a two-touchdown lead and were not to be headed. The Vikings drew first blood when number 73, Neil Elshire, forced the ball from Nielsen's hands into the arms of number 65, nose tackle Charlie Johnson. The Viking defense was running wild most of the day. They sacked Nielsen six times and forced three other Houston turnovers that resulted in constantly good field position for the Minnesota offense. And number 20, Darren Nelson took full advantage of all the open ground the Oilers were generously offering. Nelson ran for 74 yards on 13 carries, while running mate Ted Brown chipped in with two fourth quarter touchdowns that added to the Vikings 31 to 14 route of the Oilers. After seven weeks of the 1983 season, it may be somewhat of a surprise that the Vikings are atop the NFC Central behind the passing arm of Steve Dills. But it is no surprise that when teams play the Houston Oilers, victory comes rather easily.